All right, we are finally back with our man Grant Farley. Grant, it's been way too long. Uh, how you been, man? Been good, man. Nothing going on too crazy out here, but uh, currently almost 2 a.m. on the East Coast, so <laughs> podcast after dark. I love it. Yeah, we're recording this uh, Sunday night, Monday morning, whatever, 2 a.m. Eastern. Uh, preliminary talks have begun that Grant may or may not be on the Sunday night pod going forward. Connor may hop on. We'll figure it out. We'll let you know. Let's start this off with the NFL since it's fresh on our minds. Uh, maybe a little too fresh <laughs> for some of us. <laughs> Dude, Vegas was waiting for this day. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like they've been they've been doing articles like the previous weeks on how bad they've been getting hammered because almost every game the first like three four weeks were going basically as predicted. Almost the entire public was guessing every single one right, but these past few weeks, especially this week, man brutal for the public i mean i don't i would love to see if there's a single teaser out there that actually survived or even a parlay like there's probably not a single one unless you're all betting dogs something like that yeah it's insane we uh fanduel sportsbook tweeted out 99 percent of the money was on the Bengals before kickoff one percent of the money on the browns and browns went 41 to 16 after waving odell beckham thursday it, it, I mean, it goes to the theory, man, of like what we talk about. Whenever star players either like out traded or hurt, it almost seems like that's the team to hammer. Plus, whenever you're on those games, it always seems like it, it's like the worst situation you could be in because whenever you're on those games where you're massive on the public side, you never feel comfortable with it. <laughs> so any people walking with the Bengals knowing that they're 99% of the public is on it, you knew you were going to lose that game before it even started. I wonder how much money the Bengals have stolen from people these last two weeks losing to the Jets and the Browns. It's true. Yeah. I mean, you've got to think that, I mean, there's so many teams in the NFL. I think the Bengals are one of them where people just assumed after the first couple of weeks that they were just that darling of the year. Like they were just going to be the team that just blew up. Right. Um, and, and there's a couple of teams that I would say on my end, that, like I just can't put a finger on the Rams are one, the ones that just lost today to the Tennessee Titans, Titans as well. Titans literally losing to the jets, but then they're, you know, pulling around and they're winning these type of games against the Rams and, you know, I think the chargers uh, belong in that category. Yeah, Chargers for sure. Um, and again, the Bengals for sure. Uh, Ravens have just been that weird team that just always comes back from er- everyone. Seems like they just like are going down to every single team they play and they somehow find a way to win almost every single one, except for, of course, the one where they got dominated by the Bengals. So it goes back to that. Just, it's super confusing. But yeah, the NFL has been a weird, uh, a, a weird year with just teams beating up on other teams that you just would never expect. So it's very interesting. Yeah, let's start this off. So I don't think there's a single like real Super Bowl contender. I think the Bucks are probably the favorite because that Saints game was a little weird. Anytime the Bucks lose, it's kind of like when the Lakers lose in the regular season. You're like, all right, they just don't care about this game. Yeah, exactly. And I feel, I go back to the one last year when the uh, was it the Packers? I think when the Packers just absolutely drummed the the Bucks. Mm-hmm. It was like just a massive yeah. And the beat Saints down. did the same thing last year when it was like thirty eight to zero or thirty eight to three in Sunday night. Exactly. So I feel like Brady has a couple of those games every single year. We're just like, what is going on type deal. Um, But he always seems to come back stronger than ever. It's like, you know, you never count that guy out. Everyone, every time they're like, all right, this is finally it. This is the downturn of Brady. It seems like the opposite happens. So yeah, counting Brady out is never, never a good idea. And I, yeah, I I definitely assume they probably have to be the favorites at this point. You've got to assume. Yeah. Uh, Do you think the chiefs can win the Super Bowl? Uh, with that defense now shout out danny Sorensen. danny Sorensen, <laughs> be you alone yeah it's rough uh i just don't think they can that defense is rough it's just so bad and i think for years they've tried to like flex glue a lot of like the problems together by just like mm-hmm. you know a little here yeah. a little there for for patrick mahomes and i think just now it's like so many of the problems are too glaring at this point and it's just like everyone's ignored it and ignored it, ignored it for like some of these weird losses they've had but now we're seeing a more consistent type of play from them where you just can't ignore anymore. Um, And they've been ones where the public has just continuously hammered them and just continuously lose, except even today, I think they're minus seven against. uh, Yeah. They closed at six and a half, seven. Yeah. And they didn't cover. So, I mean, they're probably one of the worst covering teams in the NFL the past two seasons. Um, I'd have to look at the numbers, but I bet you they're up there. with one of They have to be the worst. Because they're always high spreads, public cameras on every single time, and they always don't – they never, never hit their spread. So, um, 
yeah, it's been rough, especially for those Chiefs fans, because people are even talking about them maybe not making the playoffs, which is insane, because they were talking about, like, you know, trying to run the table, not have a single loss, like all this stuff. And it's just interesting, because for me, looking at Patrick Mahomes, it just seems like he's not comfortable. It's weird. Mm -hmm. It's weird to see him out of his comfort zone on a consistent basis week after week after week. Because after a couple of games, everyone's like, okay, that just, you know, kind of happens. He's just trying to force things. Now it's like, what is going on? Like, what is, is this the new Patrick Mahomes or is it just, you know, it, it's just interesting to see for sure. Yeah. So just running through the games real quick. Uh, during the one o'clock games, I think every underdog won besides Panthers, Texans. Oh, and the Vikings blew it. Yep. Viking. Yeah. They blew it. They had the lead. They had, I think they had a double digit lead going into the fourth quarter, and I think they blew it. So rough for them. Yeah. And then we also got to talk about Bill's Jags. Well, maybe the worst game of the year. <laughs> like that was awful. It was awful. Urban the Meyer's only, back. The only entertaining thing was the Josh Allen comparisons that they kept tweeting out like Josh Allen, <laughs> sex Josh Allen, Josh Allen, picks off Josh Allen. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was probably the only entertaining thing for anyone watching that game was just that. Um, but man, I mean, rough. If you're an offensive fan, rough. Those that the under was hitting automatically. Yeah, no so doubt. Bad. Um, and then Falcons somehow pulled it out against the Saints. Don't know why Trevor Simeon was ever a six and a half point favorite against anybody. Uh, running through these other ones, Cowboys get their first loss. That was, I have no idea how that happened. It's, uh, since the uh, since the Bucks, right? It's like their second loss, right? Second loss, yeah, that's right. Since the Bucks, yeah, yeah, since the but I mean, they've been on a tear, right? It's been crazy. It's just weird how it works because, um, and, and going back to the Falcons, too, shout out my Braves for winning the World Series, no big deal. Um, yeah, so basically, at this point, we're playing with house money with the Atlanta game, so it doesn't even matter. I saw like a meme the other day where it was like the World Series is shielding us from terrible Atlanta Falcons football, so you know, at this point, choke city that we've been for years, you know, we actually at least produced. Uh, a title somehow so really really feeling good about that but yeah man like the, the Cowboys same thing I wonder if they rushed Dak Prescott who knows but like man like it's just interesting how these games have played out like every single team that we expected to win this game we just did not win it's so weird to see yeah so let's let's just get to it Patriots 24 Panthers 6 you said you had a Sam Darnold stat you, you said bro, you had a Sam Darnold stat. Let me hear it. All right, bro. Let me pull this up for you. This is pretty crazy. So, this is from a Jets beat writer. So, you know, they're not going to put anything <laughs> favorable out there for. for I don't think any Darnold. Panthers beat writer should too now. Exactly. So, it says the Jets traded Sam Darnold to the Panthers. So, it's talking about the picks they got six round pick in 2021 and a second and fourth rounder in 2022, which right now is looking like a really good trade because. In the past six games, Sam Darnold's one and six, or excuse me, one and five in his last six starts. And his numbers during that stretch are 109 of 199, which is a 54% completion rate for 1,098 yards for uh, four touchdowns, 10 interceptions, and he has a 56.48 QBR rating, which is horrendous, <laughs> like so bad. Um, and it's just funny because going to Sam Darnold, like the first few weeks, everyone was talking about how the Panthers have won the trade, right? Everyone was talking about how ingenious they were, how ahead of the curve they were, how he just needed to get out of that dumpster fire, which probably is true to some extent, but it's just funny how the same media that was talking Sam Darnold for basically potentially like MVP type season was what they were saying is now like, yeah, this guy's trade garbage. It's insane. <sighs> All right, let's start this off. First victim, Joe Brady. Joe Brady is the worst offensive coordinator in football right now. He is horrendous. The fact that we have scored one touchdown, we scored one touchdown in three games. The games we've played, you're like, oh, have you played great defenses? Pat's defense, all right, not bad. We had McCaffrey back in that game, should have scored a touchdown. Donald throws three picks, the worst pick six I've seen all season out of any quarterback in the NFL. I don't know why we even beat the Falcons. We had four field goals and one touchdown. And Matt Rule goes in the press conference and goes after the Vikings loss and goes, oh, this is on the defense. This is on the defense. When the offense just can't do anything. 
and he's talking, we need to rush 35 times a game behind the probably, or I think PFF has them as the 30th, 30th ranked offensive line in football. Horrible. The Panthers are horrible, horrible. The offensive offense is horrible across the board. Joe Brady has one foot out the door already waiting to LSU. There's no way there's no other explanation for this because there's, I cannot believe he got head coaching interviews last year. It's insane. Yeah, it, I mean, this it's it's unbearable to watch at this point. Like it is. They are so the rough. worst offense in football, and it's not even close. I saw some Panthers beat writers tweet out, "This is worse than the Jimmy Clausen 2010 team. 2010 Matt Moore, Jimmy Clausen when we tanked for Cam Newton. It is ten times worse than that. I mean, it's third and eight. It's over unless it's third and one. There's like a twenty five percent chance we get that first down." And that's it. Third and eight, it's zero. Third and, t- third and eight or longer, it's a 0% chance we get that first down unless we get a lucky flag. Exactly. What, what, do, you, what do you attribute to the regression? Because, again, the first few weeks, they were playing pretty it awful teams. It was bad teams. teams. It was bad teams. They yeah, got figured out. It was pretty out. bad teams. And it doesn't help that McCaffrey went out at that exact same time. And I think Darnold just relied on McCaffrey way too much. And then the second he was like, oh, crap, I have to use this fourth-round running back to do my checkdowns to – then what are you going to do? I mean, I think Darnold just lost all confidence in those games because he looked confident throwing the ball, running the ball, and all those things. O-line breaks down. McCaffrey was that rock there, and then I think the confidence is just gone. And he'll be a great backup in the, for the rest of his career. He'll be an awesome backup to have. He'll never be, he'll, he should never be a starter. He'll be a bridge guy for some teams, kind of like a Teddy Bridgewater type. But he'll be Chase Daniel the rest of his career. And I want to – didn't the uh, Panthers pick up his fifth-year option for $18 million too? I believe they did, yes. Uh, there's I want to say that there's some weird stuff early. with that, I think, though. But I could be wrong. It should be uh, – maybe we are just paying him a zillion dollars and then we'll trade him off like we're doing with Teddy and paying his contract too. It, exactly. Do you think – okay, do you think the Panthers move on from him after this year then? Absolutely. I would not be okay. shocked. If, if the Panthers are in a position to draft – Matt Corral, Malik Willis, one of these guys, Sam, uh, Sam Howell. I think you have to do it. They clearly whiffed on Justin Fields last year. I don't even know if Justin Fields is good or not, but that's another thing is that's why the Bears are just perfect because they're just like, oh, we finally we, – we're at the very end. We're about to get fired, and then, oh, let's draft this rookie quarterback, claim it's our franchise quarterback, and just keep our jobs as long as possible doing the minimum work. And that's what the Panthers have to learn is get this rookie quarterback – it gives you two to three years automatically, no matter what. Cause you're like, Oh, we're just developing, we're rebuilding. We're trying to get ready for this. That's a good point, dude. And honestly, I think the, you know, Matt Aggie where he's like, he's basically using that as a crutch, right. Where he's got time because like all the fans are claiming for Justin Fields to be in. So at this point, it's like, this is what you wanted almost. So it's almost like you can't even, the fans can't even be mad at him because it's exactly what they wanted. So no matter how much they suck, He's got, like you said, job security for an extended period of time. It is pretty genius. Um, And I think we should cover a little bit of the rookie quarterbacks, too, up to this point, kind of what we're saying, because it's been – Oh, before we get into that, I want Matt Rule fired. I want Joe Brady fired. They – it's over. Okay. It's over. It's never going to happen. Joe Brady, one, needs to be fired, no matter what. Matt Rule, I don't know what his deal is. I, I don't know if he's good or not. Everyone says he's a football genius and he's amazing. I think he's truly just a college guy. I don't think you should be taking that big of a risk on a college guy, but unless he's an Urban Meyer type, which you can't even tell if Urban Meyer is bad or not for how bad the Jags are. Exactly. Well, that's the thing, man. It's like how oh, these college co- these college coaches that come over. It's like too different. not many have been too successful. No, I mean it's like Pete Carroll has been solid, and it's like not too many after that. I mean, I guess uh, you could argue uh, Lane Kiffin, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Lane Kiffin in Arizona. He's he's super. He's been solid. Or not Lane Kiffin. Uh, who am Cliff I thinking Kingsbury. of? Cliff Kingsbury. Thank you, Cliff Kingsbury. He's been <laughs> solid. Like he's been super solid. Lane Kiffin. Yeah, still a miss. But um, like, there's only been a few. But that transition is like extremely tough. I think people don't. I think the whole recruiting game and managing adults and like these grown men in the locker room compared to just like kids that they're able to just like wow, mm-hmm. you know, in Waco, Texas. Um, it, it's just completely different. So, yeah, it's a good point, man. So you're done. You're done completely with that whole – Done. I mean, done. How, how can any Panthers watch this offense and think, wow, like this is – we're all in. Like this is awesome. 
I, I do think it's interesting that he keeps throwing the, the defense out of the bus, and that's like the one strong point. Yeah, every press conference, season. Matt Rule's just like, he's like, oh, the defense has got to get better. It's like, no, absolutely not. The defense is fine. When your offense is that bad, the defense can only hold you up so much. It's true. I mean, they're the worst offense in football. There's no worse offense in football. Like even It was the Jets. Game, it was, <laughs> no, it was no. the Jets. Now Mike White might be the next Tom Brady, apparently. Dude, we got to talk about this Mike White guy, man. All right, let's move on to the rookie quarterbacks then. What do you want to say All about right. that? All right. I mean, I just kind of want to talk about, I mean, going into that, everyone was saying, hyping this class up as like potentially the best, you know, rookie quarterback class since who knows when, since basically like Peyton Manning type class. Um, I mean, up to this point, who honestly has stuck out to you? If anyone, no, that's the thing. No one really, and I've loved this class too. Yeah, my least favorite was probably Justin Fields, and he's probably looked the best. You think so? Just Mac, Mac Jones is just in the perfect system. I think there's just a yeah. ceiling with Mac Jones. Um, I mean, but right now, if you could redo the draft over again, I think I would still. I mean, Trevor Lawrence has to go one. I still think yeah. Trevor Lawrence is good. I just the Jags are. They all walked into horrible situations except for Mac Jones and Trey Lance. Trey Lance just wasn't ready. Yeah, exactly. It was so interesting to me to see how much the 49ers gave up to go for a project. Like, that to me was so – I don't know if they had bad information. Like, they thought they were going to get someone that they weren't going to get or what the deal was there. But it does not seem to me like that was a very smart choice up to this point. Again, he could be amazing in years to come, but, like, Mm-hmm. to to sell that much for a project it's almost like a like they sold a ton for jordan love type situation obviously he's better than jordan love but like that's kind of what it felt like whereas like jordan love yeah. is for sure not ready for the league and he went super early in the first round he went like 14 or 15 in the first round and that to me seemed like a lot and this this pick trey lance to the 49ers just seemed like they gave up the world for a project which is super interesting to me and i feel like it could be one of those things that's talked about for years to come of just like awful decisions that the 49ers made yeah, and then Kyle Shanahan's job is actually on the line. Yeah, yeah, dude. His and, that and team is the rough. Panthers. The Panthers should hire him in a heartbeat. That if he's, that, if, I mean, if he's available, perfect. you have to do it. That's the problem, though. It's like if you if you fire him, who do you go after that could possibly, you know, potentially be better? It's like there's that's there's really no so. great coaching candidates out there right now. It really feels like that. It feels like you're then taking a dip into the college pool or something like that. It just seems. I guess maybe Eric Bieniemy at uh, yeah. Kansas City, but even then, the Chiefs have looked awful on offense. Exactly, and it's like you don't want to touch anyone on that defensive staff. Um, and it's like, does Dan Quinn cycle through back through and you know for another head coaching job? It's just like, what's going on here? Like, He'll have another head coaching <laughs> job in the next two years. Exactly. Like we're just. I mean, maybe or Kellen probably. Moore. Yeah. Exactly. I think Helen Moore might take a college job, but we'll see there. But I mean, like you said, I don't know who's honestly impressed me more. It's just been interesting with the rookie quarterbacks because I think people are so impatient to see these guys succeed. Like we won't know anything until at least a year down the road, at least at least until after the season's done. Then we can probably justify some of our opinions. But as of right now, just the amount of like busts, like, you know, tweets and stuff on now is ridiculous, like on everyone, including obviously our boy Zach Wilson. Which last time we talked, man, I think we talked about um, talking about college football playoff last year, and we talked about Zach Wilson potentially going number two to the Jets, and we were hoping you that know, he falls that three Fields, to the Niners. Yeah, we, exactly. <laughs> we we're hoping that whatever happened, basically, Justin Fields would play himself into the Jets' role, and obviously, it didn't happen. Uh, from what we projected, he fell way down compared to what we thought to the Bears, which is insane. Um, and here we are staring at basically. It's funny because the exact situation that's going on in New York right now with Mike White and Zach Wilson is the exact same situation that happened at BYU. The exact same one with Zach Wilson and Baylor Romney, who Baylor Romney's still on the team now, but it's, it's like identical because mm-hmm. Zach Wilson gets hurt. Right. And then from there, he's not playing and Baylor comes in place, plays good. Like is one of the better backups, you know, we've had in a long time. And then now from those, you know, few games, everyone just wants him and just expects him to be the starter. And there's like this weird dynamic shift of people wanting Baylor Romney over Zach Wilson. And, the and same then Josh Johnson as Jaron Hall. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, people are tweeting out right now that Zach Wilson's the third best, best quarterback on the team, which is insane. Like, 
here's the thing. They're not moving on from him. They, they hired John Beck as like the quarterback, I don't know, quarterback coach, but he's like basically on the sidelines now for the rest of the year. They're committed to him. And Jets fans just need to chill with the whole, you know, oh, bench. No, the kid. I'm, I'm still all in on Zach Wilson. I haven't given up yet. hundred percent. Like the fact that like, we're already like people are writing him off after like six games. It's insane. He even beat this Titans team. That's, that's, dominating i know that it probably that throw was so beautiful he was running out through that 50 yard dime to Corey davis no other rookie quarterback can make that throw no that's what i'm saying maybe five quarterbacks in this league can make that throw yeah that's the crazy thing is like you've seen the flashes and it's like they forget so quick these flashes again yeah i understand he's been playing pretty bad compared to you know what he's expected to do especially some of the short to intermediate route throws is Mm -hmm. where he's having his biggest issue which is interesting because he was nails at byu with that stuff like, it didn't matter if it was short, intermediate, or long. Like, he was money. But I will say he always has been the further he goes with the ball, it almost seems like the more accurate he's become, which is weird. But that's kind of how he's always been. Yeah, he's got uh, – Robert Sala said it perfectly. He's just got to do the boring stuff well. Yeah. And you'd rather have your quarterback learn the boring stuff than the hard stuff because you see Sam Darnold, he can't do the, the flare. I mean, him – Teddy Bridgewater, shout out Teddy Two Gloves, aka Derek on Twitter. <laughs> They're they just won't win you games. Zach Wilson can actually win you games. Yeah, he, I mean, he basically went out and won that Tennessee game where they had no business winning that game. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, he didn't have the best overtime results, but even the throws in overtime to get them down to the goal line were incredible. All right, so like, la- last thing on the yeah. NFL, Pats are the dirtiest team in football. That what they, that hit on Zach Wilson was ridiculous. I don't know how that wasn't a personal foul or anything. And then today we see Mac Jones try and twist Brian Burns' knee. Horrible. I don't know how they're not getting penalized for any of this stuff. But we're not going to hear a peep about it tomorrow. Hassan Reddick came out in the press conference and he was like, they need to be punished for that. There's so, something has to happen because of that. And Brian Burns probably won't play next week because of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I feel like there's certain teams that just get the complete benefit of the doubt, and Patriots are for sure one of those teams. The only thing they didn't get was Deflate Gate. Yeah, exactly. That's the only. And but ever since, and it almost seems like there, for some reason, there's always this like small bias for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, Tom Brady would get anything he wanted when it came to like touching him at all. And and there's certain quarterbacks that just haven't earned their stripes, I guess, that haven't gotten those calls yet. It's weird, but it feels like the NFL is somewhat pretty inconsistent with Mm -hmm. calling it the QB hits for sure. So let's move on to college football. They just came out with the college football playoff rankings this week. We see Cincinnati did not make the top four. That's college football saying, hey, if you're not a power five, you're never making it. So BYU's move to the Big 12 will make a huge difference with that. Georgia at one, they're the clear favorite. Alabama at two, it's Michigan State was at three. They just lost to Purdue this weekend. Oregon at four, they pulled that one out against Washington, right? Yeah, they did. They didn't look great. The mm-hmm. I saw a tweet, I was dying at it, where it said, like, the committee not watching our games has finally paid off, hashtag Pac-12, <laughs> because nobody's watched these Pac-12 games, and no wonder they're not watching these games, because Oregon does not have no business being ranked number four, mm-hmm. other than their win against Ohio State. Yeah, and then Ohio State 5, Cincinnati 6, uh, Oklahoma at 8, and then Michigan at 7. I don't know why I did that backwards. And then Wake Forest was at 9. That was, all, that was never going to last. No, it wasn't. But yeah, that that was one of those where you saw it and you're like, yeah, that's a fun story until they lose. And it happened the next week. So, and then we saw this weekend, Bama very easily could have lost at home to LSU as a 28 and a half point favorite. And then Cincinnati almost lost. Yeah, Cincinnati, it's funny, man. So, uh, kind of going into the whole rankings. I always like to say this when I saw the rankings come out, I'm like, look, both people arguing each side are right. As in Cincinnati fans, you're right to be pissed off. You're right to be just furious that you don't have a seat at the table. But also the the committee did get them right not in the top four because technically they don't deserve to be in the top four. Like they really don't. No. If you look at their strength of schedule, they don't deserve. Now, again, I'm not saying that's cool. I'm, I'm not saying that that's how it should be. But for the current setup it is, it's actually fair because – they have no business being top four with the strength of schedule they have this year, even with a Notre Dame win in South Bend. Like, it's impressive, but your schedule is awful. It is awful compared to most of these schools. Um, and so, yeah, like, seeing them at six, I was like, that's probably right. That's yeah. probably, like, right there. It seems like we're going to end up with two SEC teams and two Big Ten teams. It feels like we're going to end up somehow Michigan, Ohio State, and then Alabama, Georgia – 
even though I really don't think Alabama makes the playoff, I don't think they can beat Georgia. And they're going to, I feel like they're going to lose to Auburn. You do? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing with Alabama. Every time people count them out, though, that's like when they, they're the same thing. They're like one of those teams mm-hmm. where, like, I don't care how bad they look, they're, they always find Let's a get way. this out of the way. There's no way Oregon get, fit, runs the table. I just don't think they do. Yeah. I think they still have Utah looking, left, right? They got to play Utah twice, most likely. So they got to play Utah at Utah. And then I think in the Pac 12 championship game. So there's no way. There's literally, I, I will honestly say this there's no way that they can possibly win both those games. They're going to drop one of them. Um, I just don't see them getting in with two losses over because technically Oklahoma has chances to to jump Cincinnati and get in the top four too. Because they're gonna yeah, I think Oklahoma, Oklahoma has Baylor. the best shot to make it. They do undefeated. They still have Oklahoma State. They still have Baylor to to, to improve in the resume and the Big Twelve championship game. The thing is, I just don't think they beat both of those teams. I don't think Oklahoma's that good. They've been weird. They're one of the, they're just like Bama to me. Where like people just yeah. expect them to be this, and there is not. But mm-hmm. almost every team has been like that except for Georgia. So, like, Cincinnati, same thing. It's like they've been dominant in a lot in a couple of their games. The more impressive games they've been dominant. And then the games where they're supposed to blow people out, they've just kept them around. They just haven't – they haven't been covering spreads. They haven't been very impressive. Um, last week was very – it was not impressive at all. Um, so, it's, it's just interesting where we're at in college football dynamic because Georgia looks amazing. Defense mm-hmm. is incredible. But I wouldn't put it past – like, if, if you could say today – is Georgia going to win the national championship or the field? I think I'd still take the field. That's interesting because I don't know. I think you. Ha- I think the safe bet's the field, right? I mean, it's for sure the the safe bet, and I I think it's just I just see someone beating that team. It sounds weird, but like just knowing Georgia, being here in Georgia, they're they're just they're the worst when it comes to playoff football. And well, they're the worst always when, find a way when Kirby it. Smart has to make a real coaching decision. He, exactly. might be the, he might be the best recruiter in college football outside of Nick Saban and Dabo. And then he makes the most boneheaded decisions in the biggest moments. Yep. He's, he's that guy. I mean, I, I think you can't argue they have that. They have top defense for sure. Yeah. Which no, will carry no them. Doubt. That will carry them. Um, they've been incredibly But will um, it successful. against a team like Ohio State when CJ Shroud can throw for 500 yards and Travion Henderson can run for 200? That's the team that's like the – weird dark horse is like yeah. Ohio State if they can figure it out because they're one of those teams that lost early mm-hmm. to an Oregon team they should not have lost to because again Oregon to me is the least impressive out of the top four but obviously Michigan State's already out so we don't have to worry about them mm-hmm. but as of right now the top four Oregon by far is the least impressive team out of those four I would put Ohio State in there um over them I would put but again it's because the head-to-head matchup but I would put Cincinnati over them I would put like, I think Cincinnati would win by 10-plus points against Oregon. I really do. I think they would – Depends where it. the game's at. If it's in Oregon, I don't think so. The only reason why is because I'm not impressed with their quarterback. Their quarterback play is awful mm-hmm. from Oregon. It's awful. And they lost that Stanford team that is actually horrendous. The team is horrible. Um, the Pac-12 was just one of those – like, it's just not that impressive. They're always going to cannibalize sure themselves. Now. They always do it every single year. They're not good. They're just not like there's no like I mean I guess Oregon's just close to you has to lead. The but, like, ACC then, pulled that card this year. Yep, exactly. The ACC has been all over the place. They they've been all over the place. They're very similar to the Pac-12 this year. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I feel for the Cincy fans because like look, you've done everything you pretty much can. Like I've heard people with like schedule harder, schedule more, and I'm like they literally can't ske- like you can't schedule that the next year. Mm-hmm. They've done everything they pretty much can. And it sucks to see that they're probably still not going to make it because even if they went out, their strength of schedule is so awful. The back I could see Oklahoma jump them. I could see Michigan somehow jump them if they like, you know, were to beat like Ohio State and stuff like that. Yeah, like, it's going to be bad. Uh, but the only there is a path for them though. People don't think there is, but there's a real path because the Big Ten could all easily have two losses. Mm-hmm. And Oklahoma could lose two. I mean, all these teams could have two losses. Oklahoma loses, and then Bama could lose in the SEC championship. Cincinnati has to be in at that point. You're saying, okay, so Bama loses two. They have two losses at least. Uh, but to Georgia, man, I don't know if that pushes them out just because the playoff committee loves them so much. So let's just no. say they have two losses. Let's say even two lost Bama and Georgia make it in. Oh, let's say Ohio State runs the table. 
Michigan okay. has a, two losses. Michigan State has two losses. They're out. And yep. then if Oklahoma loses, if Oklahoma loses one game, I think you put. I think you still put Cincinnati at four. Even and if Oregon Oklahoma losing. wins. Yeah, okay, think, yeah, Oregon loses. Even if Oklahoma wins, I think the, if Oklahoma loses one game, since it's so close to the end of the season, I think if they lose one game, there it's over. And even if they win the Big Twelve championship, yeah, I think it has so, to be. So like, I, let, I, at that say, point, I don't know how you don't put Cincinnati in there when there's like, that many two lost like, teams, like a top ten or a top twelve, whatever it is, Oklahoma State. They lose that, then they beat Baylor, or they beat Baylor, they lose to Oklahoma State, and then they beat whoever in the ch- Big Twelve championship game. I think they'd put that over Cincinnati. I don't want to say that's right, but I think they would just because they they think that's such a big deal. The, but and also, but Oklahoma would have two losses, or no, Oklahoma has undefeated. Never mind. But the thing yeah, is, right now, loss. Cincinnati's still ahead of them. Yeah, but that's before they play. They're playing like two top fifteen teams basically in the college football playoff. Like, there's a reason why they have them ranked yeah. like they do. Like, yeah. they're for sure yeah. giving them a path. I still think there is a real path for Cincinnati. There is. There is. And they can only do so much as in like, yeah, you got to hope people lose at this point, which sucks because like you, your your fate is not in your hands. But like you said, there is a chance. Um, Bama could lose think, three games this year, like, yeah, they could, and then they they're for sure out. And if and if that happens, right? I mean, I guess they're going to be four. So you're playing Georgia week one. They'd be fun rematch from last year. <laughs> it would be, yeah. I mean, it, it basically would have the same rematch but a better team this year. And Georgia won it last year. Obviously, they shouldn't have. I think since they should have won that game, they had awful clock management at the end of the game, um, like throwing the ball when they should have ran it. It was just so bad. But I feel for Cincy. But to be honest, like if you're looking at the top four teams, like based on what production-wise, the only one that doesn't fit the bill for me is Oregon. Just because mm-hmm. like their one win is impressive. That's it. Everything else yeah. is awful. Like been close games, should have lost to Fresno State. <laughs> I was about uh, to say that. Yeah, they should have lost to Fresno State. And Fresno State now after this loss is even going to be ranked in the in the college football playoff. Um, they need to get those the UTSA Roadrunners in there, man. They need to get the uh, Roadrunners yeah. in there now with instead of Fresno State. That's uh, that just lost. Yeah. So all right, last thing or last two things. First off, if you had to choose one team to win it, who who are you picking? In the national championship. Yeah, who to win? <sighs> I like Ohio State. All right, you take Ohio State. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll Georgia just because th- that defense is incredible. I think I, I really do think I mean it's Bama, Georgia, or Ohio State. I don't think you can choose anybody else realistically. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Oregon's a realistic choice. I'm telling you, I don't think they have the offense this year to be able to do what what they mm-hmm. need to to w- beat these teams, especially if it's Oregon, Georgia, like. It's over. Like they're gonna lose by a ton of points. That's gonna be at least a twenty point spread. I, I wonder what that spread would be. Honestly, like <laughs> Oregon versus Georgia in the in in the playoff. I I bet you it'd be at least ten points. It'd probably be ten to fifteen points. You have to take Georgia. All right, last thing. Let's talk about BYU just real quick. Uh, we haven't talked since then, or on the show. We've talked obviously off the show about this. BYU to the Big Twelve. Uh, how do you feel about the move? I love it, man. Like, it's cool because for me, as like a fan my entire life, it just justifies the fanhood to an extent of like big boy football because Mm -hmm. independence, everyone, everyone is like, this is cool. But at the end of the day, it's like we were playing bowl games every single week. It wasn't real, like sustainable, fun football because you didn't really play for anything specific. There's no conference championships, conference accolades, like, you know, best running back in, in the big 12 or ACC or whatever it is. Plus, like, you have a legitimate path once we expand this thing to 12, which is going to happen, or whatever it is, 8 to 12. Like, you have a legitimate path to getting to the playoff once every five years or once every four years, right? Whatever it is, basically just winning the Big 12 championship, which I think now with, with Texas and Oklahoma leaving, which Texas and Oklahoma, and we could talk about this another day, like, they're chasing the bag, but, man, I think they're going to be for rude awakening in the, in the SEC. Like, yeah. they're going to go from – Oklahoma wins the Big 12 every year, basically to they're going to hope to win the SEC maybe once out of every, what, eight years, five years. I mean, you got to be just top to bottom, some of the best teams in the country. Like, I feel like they're they're not going to love that move long term. Besides mm-hmm. the money, the money's going to be better, obviously. Um, but, yeah, Cougs in the Big 12, I think they're going to be competitive. Um, I think the recruiting is going to go up, which is awesome. 
Um, it, it just comes down to, um, I think they've got to learn, which is so weird. We talk about this, just playing early games. <laughs> it's going to be cool because people are they're going to get some more exposure because they're not going to be playing every game from 8 to 10, 30 p.m. So we're going to be playing more day games. But, man, we're awful in day games. I don't know what that is. Yeah, uh, it makes no sense to me because they're obviously not drinking the night before for a 11 a.m. <laughs> kickoff or 10 a.m. kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so i don't know what that is but we got to get that down before we uh make that move the biggest i think winner out of everything is men's basketball mark pope i think he's the biggest winner of this whole thing absolutely those games against byu and kansas are going to be insane at the marriott center byu kansas byu west virginia byu baylor those are going to be awesome games for men's basketball like i mentioned before on the last week's pod go check it out if you haven't listened to it i predicted byu will win the, or not win they will finish in the final four. They will make it to New Orleans next year. I love this team. I love the additions of T. John Lucas and Seneca Knight. This team is going to the final four. I don't know how I can do it, but I would love to place BYU to go to the final four somewhere. That, I mean, that's that's a hot take right there. Um, I could see the drought ends end, now. The drought ends now. <laughs> I could see Elite Eight on my end, but man, final four would be incredible. I, I really think I really think they're that good. And another hot take I have right before we go, I know we're talking football, but college basketball starts in two days. Have to talk about this. I don't think Gonzaga will be that good this year. I think Chet Holmgren is not the best player in the country. I don't think he's going to be a top 10 player in this country. I think he's too thin. I could be wrong, but I, I don't see him being that influential on that team. I think Drew Timmy might be a more impactful player for them. Yeah, I actually don't think that's crazy of a hot take because I think you're right. I honestly think you always going to test them big time this year in the WCC. If they're going to win it any any time before they leave, I think this is their year. With the type of guards that they added, like you said, with Seneca Knight and Tejan Lucas, I think they have a legitimate shot. Um, my only hot take before we go away is going back to the Pac-12. I think within – the media rights are up with the Big Ten, I think in like a couple of years or something like that. I think you see a similar play of what the SEC did to the Big 12 with the Big 10 and the Pac-12. I think the Big 10 is going to scoop in and grab some of the teams like the, the biggest brands, Oregon, USC. Um, I could see, you know, Washington. Um, and I could see uh, I don't know, UCLA or something like that just to keep the two California schools happy. And I think those schools in the Pac-12 that are left out of that, Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, Colorado, like those type of schools are going to be the same situation that the big 12 was in this past year before they expanded. And what I see happening is I see the big 12 taking up teams that they used to have, like Arizona, Arizona state, Colorado. And I think it'll be like Utah for BYU or something like that. Like, I think those type of schools are going to be added into the big 12. So that's my guess, just based on what we saw this year with, with trying to consolidate power into one conference, like this Alliance thing, I think it's just, you know, just, talk basically mm -hmm. but i could totally see within a couple of years the big 10 comes and scoops up the big brands the back 12 so you're saying you watch socialism in college football <laughs> i'm just playing I'm just that's saying, all, that's I'm just saying money talks <laughs> all right that's all we got uh we'll be back on next sunday night be posted monday morning go check out all the previous episodes if you have not listened to them all on spotify pod talk apple podcast wherever you listen to your podcast check out the carter cast youtube page the tiktok page Anywhere you listen to it and find clips, anything, go follow it, support the podcast, go like and subscribe. Grant, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, nice to talk to you, man.